Uh, okay, this is. Let me try. Let me start again. Hi, this is Dr. John Bennett, broadcasting from Miami. We're broadcasting a conference from Yemen uh, with with Ishmael Abkebsi. He's the director. I'll let him take it from here. Good day, Ishmael. Uh, welcome, welcome, John, and welcome everybody. Actually, we are, we are ready for the uh, for the first lecture for the first speech. Okay. Okay. I. Okay. John, can you, everybody see my screen? Yes, I, Sister Nostomy, can yes, you see yes. the screen okay, Ishmael? Yes, it's okay. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Just, okay. just go ahead. Excellent. Hey, I, thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be talking to this group of Yemenis and the neurosurgeons. Thank you, Ishmael, for the invitation. Thank you, John, for setting up everything. Now, I would like to talk about one subject which is very near to me. It's about head trauma, which all of us know. It's one of the most important conditions in our part of the world. And uh, for me, when I go to India or China or Nepal, Head injuries are almost half the number of cases that we see, whether it may be due to road traffic accidents or it may be due to some other mechanisms. Head injuries form almost half of the cases. And yet, head injuries are operated using very primitive techniques where we do not use microscopes, we do not use any modern technology and we just do something which is a hundred year old surgery in the compressive chemical clinic. Now, I want to go into why head injuries are different and what is the last one. Now, the decompressive hemicranic to me, if you know, is a century old technique for many injuries. It is of, often a desperate large measure and it is done by the junior most of many injuries. You know, about 10 years back, when I was a junior consultant, I was called to the theater. Uh, and then I was told that I have an annual and I have an SA. I mean, I have an SH and I have a head injury. So, as usual, I told the resident that please make sure the SH is taken up first. And then I'll come for the, then you can do the decompression hemicranic to me later. But then I was called in immediately, so I went in there and I saw this very angry brain. The brain was all, I mean, the dura was open, large, uh, dura was open. So that's how we do WFMS today for many years. And I started opening the systems and I, I started hunting for the aneurysm. For almost half an hour, I did not see any aneurysm. So I asked the resident, what happened? There's no aneurysm. So he told me that this is the head injury. So I was angry. I told him, I told you to post the aneurysm first, but uh, you did not follow my orders. So he said, it's because the head injury dilates the pupil and I had to post him first. So I, I could not, he had defended himself, but the first thing I thought was that after I had opened the stunts, the brain was lax. In other words, I had treated that head injury just like an aneurysm accidentally. And the brain became lax. So, immediately I thought, why cannot I do the same thing in other severe head injuries? And that is how Sushmasmi was born. Now we have a case series of 1,500 cases. Many places all over the world have started and accepted it. There is a prospective trial going on in Lausanne, in Europe. 
there are textbook chapters, there are many things. And uh, we have come to know that the physiology in severe head injuries, acute severe head injuries, the edema is completely different from what uh, we think it is. So what, why does one does not sleep? Why does the edema come down? It's very simple. The CSF travels from the suprasalus through the Varsharabin space into the brain. So the CSF from John, I'm hearing a lot of echo. I'm hearing a lot of echo, John. Yes, yes, we, we talk. There's an echo. Mohammed, move. Just so clear. You need to move the, the smartphone away from uh, uh, away from you, Ishmael. Uh, actually, it's, it's so far. Okay, <laughs> Mohammed, could you please move uh, the smartphone further away from uh, each other? The two the two internet devices need to be away from each other. It's much better now, John. It's okay, okay it's better. Okay. It's better. It's better, uh, Ishmael. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ishmael. Thank you. Okay. So the point why cystinostomy, why cystinostomy helps is the concept of CSF shift edema. So we all know that the blood vessels are in the subarachnoid compartment. Now, from the subarachnoid compartment, from the vessel enters the brain, there are small outpouchings of the CSF around the vessels. They are called the perivascular spaces or the Warsaw-Robin spaces. They are extensions of CSF space in the brain interstitial fluid. Trauma results in multiple small vessel injury and traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. This subarachnoid hemorrhage is mostly of arterial origin it doesn't raise the pressure like in an aneurysm but it raises the pressure nonetheless within the systems and this cisternal high pressure results in a shift of csf to the brain in the stitial compartment from the systems and this is brain edema so these are the publications now how do we prove it so we did an experiment in uh, Calgary, uh, courtesy Garnet Sutherland and Sanjay Lama, who is our collaborator. So we put a we, we made a weight drop model in mice. So that is a weight drop model. 500 gram from 1.4 meters was dropped onto the mice head. And after this, the mice was taken up for a 9.4 Tesla MRI. And you see, this is the pre-trauma images, that is a post-trauma images. The difference in these images are that the intensity, the intensity of this is very high. So, we thought, why is the intensity very high? It should be two things, either could be blood or could be fluid shift. So, we had proposed earlier that the blood, there is bleeding in the subarachnoid, subarachnoid spaces, the pressure in the systems rises up and there is fluid shift. If you see the mean MR intensity image, mean MR intensity pre-trauma and post-trauma, it is clearly high. And you see in the subarachnoid spaces, there is blood. And the axons and the neurons are separated because of edema. And in the subarachnoid spaces, there is no I mean, no space at all, no fluid at all. So, this was a big proof that CSF shift edema is an actual entity. 
In the summary of results, we showed that the increased T1 intensity after trauma and there is fluid shift from subarachnoid compartment into the brain. Now, what do we do if we do decompressive hemicranectomy? Let us say that the brain is edematous because the fluid from the cisterns has shifted into the brain. And let's say we open the we open the dura. What happens? This causes herniation of that brain through the craniectomy site. This may decrease the ICP but it causes severe stretch injury to the brain. It is a wrong answer. And this is what happens. We have seen, we have seen this. So the answer I'm going to tell you now. We have to open the cistern to so the atmospheric pressure. Now the brain has high pressure and the cisterns have low pressure. The gradient of CSF will reverse and the brain edema will reverse. Case of shift back. Now we're going to show you a few. In other words, let's look at this cartoon. This is the brain that is a cistern. There is subarachnoid hemorrhage. The cisternal pressure goes up and the brain expands, the answer is this, open the systems to atmospheric pressure. Again, we are showing the brain communicates with the systems, subarachnoid hemorrhage raises, this happens, brain the system, reverse gradient, Brain edema comes down. I'm going to show you some cases. That is a 31 year old male, a road traffic accident, E1, M3, V1, left pupil dilated. What would you do in these kind of cases? There are a lot of very important radiological signs. If you see that, that is a pre pontine or the CP angle system. Okay, the pre pontine system is here, the CP angle system is here. It is widened. You see, it is widened. You know why it's widened? Because the pressure on this side, the, sub, the acute subdural on this side, has put so much pressure, midline shift. So the parahippocampal gyrus is pushing on the midbrain and causing the midbrain to shift to the right side. And that is why the CP angle system is wide. This means that the patient is going to herniate. You can see the large contusion here. You can see there are almost no cisterns seen. Cisterns are not seen. The usual answer would be a decompressive hemicranectomy on the left side. And this wouldn't really help the patient too much. You see again, you see how much edema that there is. First of day two, this patient is extubated. E2, M5, V2, intact on the dental edges is 15. No decompressive hemicranic to be done. We only did, we opened the system. See, now the systems are completely beautifully seen. The CP angle system is still widened. But you see the brain flap, the brain is not coming out. Brain flap is beautifully kept back. So this is one of our papers, exploring Varshorabin function, unified theory of brain diseases. Systemostomy, if you are starting off, then easier to start, start off with the decompressive clinic flap. Adequate sphenoid wing removal after evacuating the subdural. If you look in the if you look in YouTube and type systemostomy, you will get the operative videos. You will get a lot of operative videos, and um, so I am not going to show those operative videos here. You will get it on the YouTube, and uh, you will get articles on the uh, methodology of how to do systemostomy. 
So if you are a beginner, you wouldn't want to open the membrane of mucus because it is uh, you can open it only after some experience. If uh, senior people like Ishmael, who has do, who are doing annual films, they can do it. But the junior residents, it will be difficult for them to open the membrane of reliquus. So after opening the membrane of reliquus, we put a drain into the prepontine system. And once, if the brain is lax, you put the bone back, bone flap back. And uh, after all these number of cases, our duration is about 15 minutes. Well, sometimes you need advanced maneuvers. So to get into the base, the systems are in the base of the brain. The brain is very edematous. So to get into the base of the brain, sometimes, very rarely, you, you need maneuvers like anterior clinoidectomy, division of orbitomeningeal band, transcavernous dissection, posterior clinoidectomy, access to skull base in a tight brain, and to divide the membrane of ridicus, we need all this. But this is this is very rare. Usually, if you do a decompressive hemicranectomy uh, and turn the head to the other side, extend the head, you can easily go along the anterior skull base and you'll be into the optical keratin system. And if you open the optical keratin system, you will have some more space and then you can open the uh, interoptic system. You can go in through the interoptic system into the uh, membrane of reliquus and open the membrane of reliquus. A lot of people ask me, why does ventricular drainage system work? You must understand the ventricles have only 20 ml of CSF. They are compressed in trauma and they do not communicate with the parenchyma. Cisterns have 120 ml and they communicate with the parenchyma. How do you know this? This is the experiment. So, G lymphatic pathway, they introduce, they put ventricular infusions, they put intracystinal infusions. And you see, this is the ventricular infusion. Nothing in the parenchyma. This is a systemal infusion. In half an hour, everything is in the parenchyma. So which, this means that systemal CSF communicates with the brain, while ventricular CSF doesn't communicate with the brain. So your answer of a brain swelling is not actually a ventricular entity. So this is another one of our papers, Anatomy and Physiology of this must be. This is another one. This is in the World Neurosurgery. So I'll go to the anatomy of cystinostomy now. So what we are seeing right now is the carotid. That's a third nerve. That's a basilar. And in fact, incidentally, we, we did this dissection as a part of, I'm part of the WFNS anatomy committee. So I did this dissection in Paris and we found this uh, small aneurysm among the basilar. So that is your uh, superior cerebral adduplication. Superior cerebral, that is P1, that is the contralateral P1. That is the posterior clinoid process, that is the third nerve, that is the, uh, that is the carotid, that is the optic nerve. So that is the frontal, frontal uh, lobe and that is the temporal lobe, and that is the cavernous sinus. There, and uh, this is exactly what we do in cystinostomy. Uh, so we are bringing microsurgery into trauma. So you can see the videos uh, on YouTube. And uh, well, I am also in charge of ACNS, uh, the Asian CNS educational courses. We have these cadaver workshops, and if we can even do it on the web, let me try and do it on the web so that we can uh, interact with you and uh, probably talk to you. Mile, we can talk to you about uh, the kind of trauma that you deal with, and uh, maybe we can uh, talk about cases, and then we can have discussion and we can hang out with the. Uh, many masters from many fields so uh, it's been an honor so that would be my first talk i am not showing the operative video if you'd like to do you want me to show an operative video yeah okay uh, i will try it if you like yes ishmael you want to try the video yeah okay uh, just a short yeah okay uh, we, we give it a shot for a while we can we can see a video okay Okay. So let me go into. I I will have many videos on uh, my Facebook. Are you seeing? Um, yes, I, we can't see the video yet. We see your Facebook page. <laughs> How do I get into my? Ah, okay, videos. Okay. 
Here we go. Let me show you a good systemostomy video first, and then are you seeing the video now? Uh, yes, uh, yes. You can see the smell. Starting, okay? yes. So that is after the systemostomy is done. You can see how lax the brain is. Uh, so I'm just showing the anatomy here. That is the optic nerve. That is a carotid. Uh, that is the third nerve will be here. So I'm going to open, even after opening the optic carotid, that you can see the anterior communicating artery complex here, in here, and I'm opening the membrane of uh, the carotid third carotid oculomotor arachnoid. I'm opening lateral carotid window. I'm opening. This is a video five years back. So uh, we will be able to show you more reasons also. And now, once I've opened, that is a posterior clinoid process. That is the A1. Hello? Yes. Taking the glass. Taking the glass. Yeah, so that is a basilar. That is a basilar. That is superior cerebellar. That is P1. This is the basilar tip. Here is the basilar tip. So this can be done only in a very lax brain. So uh, there was subarachnoid hemorrhage which was removed, and then now you can see the entire basilar now. So this uh, this is at the uh, big I mean, at the end of the cystinosmy. Let me show you something, some cystinosmy which is not good, which is not very good. So here you go. See now acute subdural. Can you see? Can you see? Yes. Yes, we can see you it. See the pressure at which the acute subdural is coming out? It's a little cloudy. It's a little cloudy. Okay. Better? better? That's better. Okay, right. So the acute subdural is being taken out. I'm going into the optic now. Even now, the brain is a bit full. I have done the cystinostomy. Now I am opening. The rest of the the rest of the dura. Well, in all acute subdurals, you don't need to do a cystinostomy. But in acute subdurals, uh, where you have pressure, you can put this drain into the prepondine system, just like I showed you last case, and see how lax the brain is. I mean, you don't, you really don't need to now. Very bad acute subdural with the bus law. Okay. Again, small incision, not large incision. See the brain coming out? You will see the brain coming out. See the brain coming out? Yes. Under high pressure. It's under high pressure. See, brain coming out. So, no need to worry, but you go on the base and you see the CSF welling out. See, CSF welling out. This is the reverse shift. You keep on. This patient on his scan, there was no CSF at all. But you keep on, keep on sucking out. That is the optic nerve. That's the carotid tear. You can see the CSF coming out. See? Again, very badly damaged. Okay. And at the end of it, you can see small incision, small incision, and you can see the brain nicely pulsing. Okay. Nicely pulsed time. Would you like to see more uh, CT scans? What's up to Ismail? Uh, actually, uh, 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 the condition is so difficult. And uh, uh, you, if you have a small, uh, simple picture just to, to clarify the procedure, it will be easy for the, for the audience. Because uh, a cystinostomy is a very uh, uh, delicate uh, procedure and uh, most of the uh, neurosurgeons are not familiar with yes ishmael i appreciate that okay. See, uh, one thing i can tell you is when you start off you don't want to do a lot of maneuvers you do a decompressing all when i started off what i did is i did a decompressing chemical just extended the head let me just let me take off my screen sharing so that we can see each other yeah, there you go. 
How do I stop the screen sharing? No, it stopped there. I we can see your yourself. Right. So I'm going to show you this. Okay. So uh, let us say when we start the system on screen, we we have this large mm -hmm. flap, and okay. After that, the thing that you need to find out is you have to remove this phenoid bridge completely after the decompressive hemicranic is done. Uh, before opening the dura, you need to remove this phenoid bridge completely. And after that, this, this orbital roof also, as much as possible, you, you nibble off. And then once you open the dura, your retractor should come all the way. Let's say the retractor should come all the way down like that. So, so that one comes to the optic nerve and the carotid and opens the systems. So the retractor should be guided by the optic roof, the orbital roof. The retractor should be guided by the orbital roof. So once this comes in like that, then the systems are going to be open. Once the systems are open, it's fairly easy uh, to get into the uh, get it between this optic and the carotid. If you have a microscope, get it between them and open the membrane of the request also. Now I agree, this is a difficult procedure, but if you open it at least, um, if you open it at least the optic carotid window, the brain is going to get lax immediately. It's not going to take a long time. Now, I have a lot of uh, colleagues who are doing aneurysms and it's very easy for them. So, a senior like you, Ishmael, probably take the lead. Just do it like an aneurysm, just like a WFNS grade 5 aneurysm. And I know maybe you do not go for trauma, but the junior colleagues are not going to be able to handle this. From decompressive hemicranectomy, it's difficult for them to graduate into systemostomy over a, over a period of days. Dr. Shirian, uh, actually the, the approach is very difficult. It's, it's the same as a skull-based approach. And uh, do you think uh, a very uh, to see a difficult and dangerous approach is the perfect, uh, uh, I mean, is uh, good enough to, uh, to make a procedure like this? I mean, uh, the rate of the complication in the skull-based approach is usually great, is usually high. I understand, but can I show you some CT scans? Oh, yeah, please. I will show you some CT scans. Okay. And then uh, you will see We are waiting. Yes, yes, uh, I. Uh, of course, uh, some some of the uh, of the colleague he cannot uh, imagine uh, uh, a such a big procedure for uh, just to drain the CSF and the and the subacrate hemorrhage, and uh, I think especially we have here a neurologist who are usually uh, going with the side of the conservative therapy. So, how can we convince him to make a big procedure like this just to to uh, to decompress the uh, the pressure and to decrease the ICB? I mean, I have to have a magic uh, argument just to convince our, our neurologists in the, in, the, in the hospital because uh, they are just agree with the, uh, a simple, clear procedure, a clear indication and great result. As such, uh, a complicated surgery with uh, uh, no guarantee for the result, I think you have to think uh, more than more than once. Are you agree with me, Chirian? I agree with you. In fact, when we started off 10 years back, this was exactly what people were telling me. But I am showing you some of my older scans. I am screen sharing now. Then you will see. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Uh, <laughs> not yet, I. One second. I am closing off all the windows. Okay. I'm closing all the windows. Okay. Whoop. We lost type there. 
<laughs> so, okay. I will just hop back on uh, uh, Ishmael. Don't worry. Yes. Uh, 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 Sometimes the technical uh, side of the of the of the procedure is is, is, is very difficult. Uh, actually, myself, uh, uh, I have no experience regarding this uh, sort of surgery. Uh, we have a lot of options to decrease the ICB, which are simple. Uh, uh, it is very difficult to to understand. Uh, to make a big procedure like this, it is uh, the same as a uh, skull base approach. It's the same approach like a, an aneurysm clipping or, or, or other skull base tumors. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the risk is great. The complication, uh, they are uh, enough to think again about the education. And uh, in our society where you still have a lot of a problem with the with the uh, with the family and the and the patient next of cans i think you have to consider uh, the benefit against the risk issue and to think again and again yeah, okay, Ishmael, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you some uh, scans you see this patient okay please yes, we, can see, we can see the scans i yeah this is a patient who had a traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage and you can see this patient is completely okay for two days and he just dilated his pupils. You know that one out of nine patients who has traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage in just day three, sometimes suddenly develops edema and they, they deteriorate. And we had to take him, you see there is a subarachnoid hemorrhage everywhere. And this patient deteriorated and we had to take him to theater and we found severe swelling, severe swelling. And this is one of the reasons why we started thinking that traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage and aneurysm subarachnoid hemorrhage has a similar mechanism. You see, we did not do a decompressive hemicranectomy, we did a, a cystinostomy, and this brain is quite lax now. This patient went home. Now I'm going to show you another, another case. This is severe brain swelling. Severe brain swelling. This patient was uh, airlifted to us from uh, the capital. And you see, no systems are seen. There is acute sub I mean, acute uh, subdural hemorrhage. There is burst slope. And uh, CPI angle cistern is widened. The other ventricle is dilated because of torsion. And you see, it's, it's pretty bad. Okay. This is after cisternostomy. Okay. This patient went home completely okay. Another one, this is a child whom we were called and with this scan in the emergency, the child was okay. The child was motor score of five. The cisterns are seen, but suddenly this child deteriorated to motor score two and we took him up for cisternostomy. So you see the kind of damage this child had. So this brain, you can see it sitting in the prefontine system after the cystinosomy was performed but you see the brain is not bulging out you know unlike in a decompressive hemicranic the brain is not you see the severe damage you see the damage here severe now this is the child when before discharge at discharge and another patient severe swelling you see on the left side, no cistern seen. Okay, it's massive, mass effect. People would do a decompressive, and even if you do a decompressive, this patient is not going to do very well. We all know that. Okay. So, this is after the case. No brain is not bulging out. Cisterns are open. Brain is not bulging out. So, we have so many cases like this to show. And on our on my Facebook, you can see we always publish this kind of cases. Uh, I mean, so many of them. Recently, uh, I would be very happy to show you many more cases like this if you want. And even most of these things are published now. Yes, ten years we have been going on, and what Ishmael told me is the questions that people have been asking me for ten years. Is it really worth to do such a big surgery for trauma, and is the results different? I can tell you the results are very different. The results are different from okay. day one. 
It is not only different from later on, it is different from day one. During surgery itself, you will see that the brain swelling is down, number one. And number two, my point is that the number of cases of trauma is much more than the number of aneurysms. So I think we should stop seeing that trauma is less important and aneurysms are more important. But this is one of the, the, the this is one of the things that we, This is one of the things that we are seeing that a lot of people all over the world it is a consideration that trauma is emergency and uh, aneurysm is an elective case and therefore aneurysm is important. It is not so. It is the same importance that trauma and aneurysms have. And if aneurysms, we can do all this skull based approach, why not for trauma? It is the same life. So I, I would beg you to change the attitude of people in your country that trauma is less important and you should do once you see once you start seeing the less swollen brain on your operating table then you will be convinced it is a only a matter of seeing it but it cannot be done by junior residents or junior consultant it has to be done by somebody who's senior and if you select the right case for an acute subdural which you were going to decompress, if you do the large flap and then go and open the cistern, at least the opticocarotid and intraoptic cistern, immediately you will see the brain coming down. And this is my point. And once after that, then you can go on to more difficult cases and do all these fancy manuals. But just a simple acute subdural, you will see that you will not need to decompress if you are opening the system and putting a catheter. Okay, okay, I have, uh, excellent presentation. I think uh, Ismail wants to move on to your next talk. Uh, correct, yes, Ismail? Uh, uh, Mr. John, actually, uh, it was a great uh, uh, speech that highlighted on a new thing uh, for us. The cisternostome is still a new, a new issue. Thank you so much. A great presentation and a very excellent job. Thank you so much. Actually, we, have, uh, we can pass to the to the next speech because uh, time is uh, is hot here. Okay. And we are going to go further. Okay. Uh, now, I is scheduled for uh, skull based cases. Uh, would you like him to continue with his presentation? Yes. Please. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I. So I am going to talk on anterolateral skull base now. I am going to share the screen, and after this, I will show you. Uh, I will show you a small case also from YouTube. Um, so I am going to show you uh, this case, this uh, presentation now. Am I? I am screen sharing now. Okay. 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 Yes. Okay. Yes, we can see. Okay. Everybody's waiting. You can see it okay, Ishmael? Yeah, please go on. Okay. So, in anterolateral skull base, there are three things that helps the surgeon to become better and better. One is the carotid, one is the meningo orbital band, and one is visual recognition. The carotid, if you know the segments of carotid, it really helps you because that is your biggest fear. As a skull base surgeon, in actual lateral skull base, your biggest fear is the carotid. So, we are going to talk about the carotid in relation to skull base. There are seven segments. There are many classifications, but I am following the least difficult classification. There are seven segments. We want to see seven. So C7, all the odd segments, that is C3, C5, C7 are vertical. They are related to all cranial nerves from 2 to 12. One segment of, every segment of carotid in some way, directly or indirectly, is related to a cranial nerve. You will see how it is. And it is a structure that keeps potential skull base surgeons at bay. Drilling over and in proximity to carotid is essential to become an established skull base surgeon. The rest is anatomy, anatomy practice. So now let us start off. 
that is the segment which gets it is called it, by the ENT surgeon is called the parapharyngeal carotid. This is C7. So C7 carotid gets entry from the neck into the skull. It is a vertical segment. That is a Peter's carotid. That is C6. C6, as you notice, is horizontal. And at the transition point of C6, that is at the Peter's apex, you have a petrolingual ligament. That is C5 in the cavernous sinus. C4 in the cavernous sinus. C3 again in the cavernous sinus. So, and this is the intradural canal. C2. So you saw that? C7 segment is vertical. Yes, C5 segment is vertical. C3 segment is vertical. So C7 is the carotid entry. That is a parapharyngeal carotid. This is C5, paraclival carotid. And this is the C3, which is paraclinoid carotid. So for the endoscopy, guys, they look from the front. They will see the paraclinoid carotid. They will see the paraclival carotid and they will see the parapharyngeal carotid. So C6 is Peter's carotid and C4 is intracavernous carotid. So C5 is intracavernous, C4 is intracavernous, C3 is intracavernous. This is the carotid side. Now there are this trunk is very this vessel is very important. This is the meningohypophyseal trunk. Uh, so now we are going to look at some more structures. That is lateral to the C3. Okay, this is C3. Lateral to C3. Third nerve comes. Fourth nerve comes. V1 comes. And they all enter the superior rotunda. V2 into the foramen rotunda. V3 into the foramen ovale. That is the GSPN, which is parallel to the petrous carotid on the petrous surface. This is GSPN when you do an anterior petrosectomy. This is what helps you. That is a eustachian tube which is lateral to the carotid in the petrous form. That is a cochlea. That is a cochlea. The carotid C7 carotid, the ascending C7 carotid is anterior to the cochlea. So you have internal auditory canal here. Posterior to that is a semicircular canal. You have semicircular canals, internal artery meatus, cochlea, C7. And lateral to the C, C uh, lateral to, this is C6, lateral to the C6 is the eustachian. So you have GSP, you have 3, 4, V1, V2, V3. This is the intracavernous carotid. This is C3. You have C5, you have C7. All 3, 5, 7, vertical. That is the clivus. That is the posterior clinoid process. That is the anterior clinoid process. And this anatomy, if you know, you are very good. Now, I'm going to show you an aneurysm which arose from C2 segment, but was to get the control of this aneurysm, I had to cut the distal dual ring and the proximal dual ring. The distal dual ring and the proximal dual ring are the distal dual ring actually tethers the tethers the carotid into the anterior clinoid process. Proximal dual ring, if you cut, you are entering the cavernous sinus itself. Okay. So we're going to show you an aneurysm where we had to cut the distal dual ring, proximal dual ring remodel the neck. The aneurysm is like that. There. So we had to remodel the neck and then we have to apply the clip here. I'm going to show you that right now. Wow. Oh, I can just show it directly from my My desktop. Better climate. 
Can you see this? Yes, uh, it's a CT scan, correct? No, 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 it is a video actually, okay. but uh, I will show you. Can you see? Yes. So you can see this aneurysmal rupture here. Yes. And you can see that is spinoid, and that is aneurysm. That is aneurysm. Okay. You can see the aneurysm there. And this is the this is the anatomy, the distal dural ring. That is the third nerve there. The aneurysm was like this. So optic nerve, erotic, the aneurysm was like that. Do you see now? We are removing the optic strut. Removing the optic strut and the last portion of the anterior clinoid. We drilled away the anterior clinoid. The last part of the optic strut is not good to be drilled. It is always good to remove it with a small forceps. And now that is a carotid. That is aneurysm. We have put. So you can see C3 is coming up. C3 is vertical. So you can see the vertical portion. That's the cavernous sinus. That is a that is a cavernous sinus. This is the, the horizontal portion of the carotid. And we are now going to redesign, remodel the aneurysm neck. That is a vertical segment, C3. And the C3 is in the cavernous sinus. You can see the optic nerve there. That is the horizontal segment. So we have now made space for the clip to pass there. This is the aneurysm there. We have put proximal clips and we put distal clips and then now we are going to put the clip on. If you know how to expose the cavernous carotid, it becomes a very easy uh, case. But if you don't know how to do this, then it becomes a very difficult case because to pass the clip, uh, it becomes very difficult. So that is a clip that I was So it is not a big approach. It is a F, I mean, frontotemporal approach, anterior clinoidectomy, dividing the distal and the proximal dural ring. And after that, you have defined the neck again and then go on and clip this animal. You will see in the post op city that is uh, one of the legs of the clip is almost in the camera sinus, but the third nerve is completely okay. Is the patient after surgery? So that aneurysm was here, and the neck was here. So we could remodel it, and then we could clip it here. That is because I could take off the anterior process, and I could cut the proximal and the distal dural ring. You must always remember that the third and the fourth and the V1 nerves are there. Third and fourth are just lateral, inferior to the anterior clinoid process. Now, the concept of meningo orbital band. The meningo orbital band, when you take off your sphenoid fish, the most lateral part that you see is you call it superior orbital fissure, but that is actually the meningo orbital band. Meningo orbital band, if you see the superior orbital fissure, is in this shape. Let us start reconstructing it again. That is a 3 4 V1 and C3 now. So if you cut here, these nerves are going, not going to be harmed. Now, I will tell you why do we cut here. Again, this is just a schematic representation. The cavernous sinus is not like this. But this is the true cavernous membrane. That's the cover of the cavernous sinus. That is 3, 4 and V1 is in the cover, almost on the cover. Sixth is truly inside the cavernous sinus. I mean, we all know that. Now we cut it here, we cut it here, there is a small artery there, we, uh, we cauterize that artery and then we dissect here. If we dissect and take this dura off, we are opening the anterior clinoid process. And if we take this dura off from here, that is a temporal lobe, that is a frontal lobe. You see the frontal lobe, it's a temporal lobe. So you 
take off the temporal lobe from the true cavernous membrane, take off the frontal lobe from the anterior process. First thing first, you're uncovering the anterior Makes it very easy for you to remove the anterior Second thing, you're opening up the brain and you, it becomes very easy for you to get to the base. So that is what you're doing right now. You are cutting and then dissecting this dural fold above from the anterior process. And then you are dissecting it away from the true cavernous membrane. I mean, usually if you dissect, if you go transcavernous, there will be a lot of bleeding and you probably inject. Earlier, we used to inject fibrin blue inside the cavernous sinus to produce an electrogenic cavernous sinus. In the there is no need to do this. If you can keep the true cavernous membrane intact, there will be no bleeding. And even if there is a small bleeding, there will be a very small point which you can easily control off with a small piece of. Uh, um, surgical cell and fibrin. So we're going to show you the anatomy here that I'm sure everybody will recognize. Optic nerve, that's the pituitary stalk, carotid, the third nerve, the fourth nerve, the posterior recliner process, and that is the basilla. You know, in some cases for my basilar aneurysms, I drill the posterior planar process. So this is a very dangerous manual, but uh, I drill it and in some cases of trauma, where I cannot open the membrane of the locus, I also open the, I also drill off the posterior planar process. But believe me, this is something that you really don't want to do when you are uh, in the beginning stage. So maybe uh, I can show, I mean, the PCP drilling videos are there on the YouTube, for sure, you can see it, but what is more important right now is not PCP drilling, the anatomy is more important, it's for the visual recognition. So, that is the optic nerve again, that is a carotid, that is your distal dual ring, that is your third nerve, and if you remember, that aneurysm was here. So I had to cut this distal dural ring and then uncover this aneurysm so that I have this space to put my clip on. Now it's a small quiz program. So maybe Ishmael can conduct this quiz for me. What is this? You can, Ishmael, you can ask your uh, residents, your uh, colleagues, boys, the junior. I think everybody is hearing. Uh, uh, can you just answer the Mr. Cherian about the structure was he asking for? Uh, I think it's sometimes difficult to, to throw you, uh, Cherian. Uh, okay, this have, is first. Uh, an echo. And okay, okay. Just go on. That is a posterior recliner process. Third nerve. Mm -hmm. Superior cerebellar artery. Basilar at P1, yes. P1, P1, okay. And again, this is the distal neural ring. And this is this one which was cut. So you can see after cutting the distal neural ring, you can see the vertical C3. C5 is going to be here. And C6 is going to be on the pictures. So that is the horizontal. So that is P1, P2, P3. That is the third now coming from the interpendicular fossa, going into the oculomotor trigon, and there. And this space was initially occupied by the anterior clinoid process. Now let's see again. That is C3, that is C4. C5 is vertical again, C3 is vertical, C5 is vertical, and this is C6 pitoscarotid. So you have GSPN, this is the facial now, this is the GSPN, which is going parallel to the C6. This is V3, V2, V1, and you can see one small now coming medial to the V1. This canal is called the Dorolos canal, and it is a sixth nerve which is coming through the Dorolos canal. And in the cavernous sinus, it is medial to V1. Okay, and that is a meningohypophysic trunk. 
So you have that is ophthalmic artery, that's optic nerve. That's the endoscopic surgeon's view. You have C3, that is a para, clinoidal carotid, that is a clivus, and that is C5, that is a para clival carotid. And that is C4, that is C4, which is intracavernous carotid. Pituitary gland, optic nerve. Again, you have V1, V2, third nerve, fourth nerve, C5 of the carotid, C4, anterior clinoid process, C3, that is the C3 carotid, lorelose canal, that is the sixth nerve coming in, sixth nerve coming in, medial to the V1. And this is the petrolingual ligament which I told you about. So you you have the petrol this is the petrous carotid and this is c5 that is intracavernous carotid that is the at the junction you see this petrolingual ligament see if you know sometimes you remove skull based tumors and you are not in control the tumor makes you remove it it rushes you and at the end of the day they say, oh my god, the surgeon, he has removed the tumor, but the tumor was like this, and you were like this. Okay? But if you know anatomy, if you know anatomy, you will be this, and the tumor will be here. Very, very important that you know anatomy. If you want to do cystinostomy, if you want to do laryngeal base aneurysms, if you want to do tumors, to be here, you know anatomy. So now your uh, homework would be, you find out optic nerve, third nerve, fourth nerve, V1, 2, 3, 6 nerve, GSPN, U station 2. What is the paraclavial carotid and what is paracellar carotid? How is the carotid related to the cochlea, tympanic membrane, and facial nerve? And how is the carotid related to nerves and well, high neck dissection? And we talked about the skull base approaches in trauma. Thank you very much. It was an honor. Very Six. good. Very good, I uh, Very good. Thank you very much for an excellent, another excellent presentation. Oh. Um, and I'll let uh, Ishmael direct uh, where we go from here. Ishmael? Uh, Mr. John, uh, actually, it was a great uh, lecture. And everybody knows uh, anatomy is, uh, is anatomy, and the neurosurgery is anatomy too. Scalp surgery, it's a carotid anatomy, and of course, still a very important and vital issue. Uh, thank you for highlighting the, the, uh, this important thing, and it was uh, present assembly and in a good way. Thank you, Chirian. Actually, we are, we are on time, and we showed uh, sharply on the 10 a.m. going to the formal uh, ceremony. So I will be happy just to start the uh, third lecture. And thank you, Sherry, for your uh, great uh, presence today and your excellent presentation. Thank you from my heart. And uh, it was a great chance to have you. And I hope to see you uh, more and more in the future. Uh, and uh, again, uh, the homework which you, which you, which you uh, uh, gave should be answered by every, every one of, of our residents. We are going to throw them anyway. And uh, I enjoy. I hope you have a good day, enjoy your time. Thank you so much. Okay, now uh, I think, uh, Mr. John, it's a time to go for the last one, for the last lecture, for 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 the first session about the keyhole approach in the posterior fossa mean tumors, which is still a very important uh, subject. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ishmael. Let me introduce uh, Joffrey Portillo. He's a neurosurgeon from Cuenca, Ecuador. As you said, he's going to talk about keyhole approach to posterior fossa meningiomas. Welcome, Joffrey. Hello, Mr. Joffrey. Hello. Good morning. Good morning to the colleagues. Good morning to the colleagues. Be a part of this Congress. You hear me? Okay, Jeffrey, go ahead. Yes, Jeffrey, we are, we are uh, listening. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Okay. 
Okay. Oh, really? Uh, I'm really grateful to share uh, with you, all of you, uh, a part of conference uh, to introduce uh, a big word of the, of the neuroendoscopy. Okay. Uh, now, in the, I, I, I'm talking about the uh, to the to the uh, specifically uh, into the uh, meningiomas of the posterior fossa, which uh, uh, a new uh, it's a new concept to the meaning approach to the school base. In this case of the posterior fossa, now. I'll share with you uh, the Okay, we're well, having some Thanks. connection problems, like I believe. Uh, John, it is from Mexico, yes? yes. Okay, yes. yeah, I, I think uh, it's okay. Uh, just hang in there. Uh, we're having some connection problem. Uh, Okay, uh, what you're going to, can we proceed or we have another option? Okay, let's see, well, let's see if, okay, uh, okay. Okay. can you hear me, Jeffrey, okay? Yes, okay. Okay, continue, Jeffrey, please. Okay, okay, okay. Um, this is from Jeffrey's side, the, the technical issue. Um. Uh, okay. Okay, Jeffrey, you may have to come in and come out. You may have to leave and come in again. Okay. Let, let's just try this, Ishmael. Let me sometimes. Can. Uh, I mean, uh, we can okay, just there try we go. again. There we go. This might be better if we just share the screen. Still, we have uh, a few minutes, so we, we have time actually. And just give him a chance to try okay, again. Can you, can you see the PowerPoint? Okay, go ahead, Jeffrey. Okay. okay. You're not sharing the correct screen. Actually, we are now connecting between the uh, Sana and Miami and Mexico. And of course, uh, there are uh, uh, three uh, different. Uh, uh, Intercontinental will be difficult from the technical out of view. Okay. But anyway, okay. we have time. Okay, I think we got it. We got it now. Go okay. ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, 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 firstly, uh, uh, to talk about the uh, posterior force approach, the keyhole posterior force approach is necessary to, to talk about the, the, the first uh, procedures in the 70s. Uh, to to begin the the style of procedure uh, for the fifty and fifteen up mortality in the procedures or or on in the initial procedures resections were patient and in many cases were considered inoperable uh, given the the technique development. Surgery, uh, the approach of the steamers is possible with the acceptable or within a mortality. Uh, to the 17s uh, uh, and to days are now, uh, the, the mortality was decreased uh, very importantly. Uh, or is to the posterior fossa approach in, in this case the meaning of, of the posterior fossa is necessary to to classificate the localization of the of, the, of this type of tumors is that the castellano Ruggior, uh, has a interesting classification to classificate in five groups uh, depending on the size of the implantation or the size of the of the of these meningiomas in the first step, the meningiomas, the, the classification of the of the ruler is the, the the localization of the 
different parts of the of the uh, of the of the uh, posterior fossa. Uh, first, the first group is in the bone. The second group is in the clibus uh, part of the occipital bone. The third is in the cerebellar. The fourth uh, is in the tympanify is in the uh, meningiomas. The use of limited approach causes different shortcomings during the procedure, such as the final surgical cordon, decreased intraoperative orientation, and narrow angles angles with an almost quartial control of the microinstrument. It's important to know uh, this type of the limitants of the neuroendoscopic uh, procedures because uh, the neurosurgeon uh, needs to bring a, 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 a training uh, to, to uh, more easy the, the, this type of procedure. Important to delay intensity uh, in the deep sea in the operating field because if we have not uh, an uh, appropriate uh, instruments and light is very difficult to, to, to try to uh, procedure. The scope offers more economical tissue. In this, in this slide, we show uh, a, a different types of, of procedures. Uh, in the first uh, pictures, we see a, a microscopic uh, neurosurgeon with an um, uh, ingenious position. And uh, in, the, in this type on the endoscopic procedure, is more easily uh, to the neurosurgeon and to the patient uh, become a more a more fast and more easy procedures. All right, the clinical picture of the meningiomas of the posterior fossa. Uh, uh, in general, uh, the average of onset of symptoms range uh, initially from three to five years. See this pre presentation, uh, like a headache, axia, hair loss, yeah, facial pain, paresis for cranial nerves, case. Uh, we know the, this style of, of, of clinical picture, uh, and it's not necessary to 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 live in this type part of the time. Uh, show the classical approach uh, before the keyhole approach of the minimal invasion procedures in the posterior fossa. Uh, first, the, the retrosymoid approach, the suboccipital medial, suboccipital lateral approach, the combined approach, uh, the combined, combined, combined approach, the approach uh, in different uh, types uh, like a retrolabyrinthic with the preservative hearing but a small field of hearing, the translabyrinthic uh, for the patients with sacrificates the, the hearing, transcochlear uh, approach works based through a maximum retraction of the petrous bone, sacrificing the hearing and making facial length transposition in some cases. Type of, of classical approach in the the concept uh, of the of the of the keyhole in the lateral suboccipital approach, suboccipital transtractorial approach, suboccipital in, in caudal, caudal variation, and the telovenar uh, uh, approach. Uh, in the key, in the keyhole concept, the it's important, it's very, very, very important to, to make some steps uh, to, to finish uh, in a grateful uh, surgery. Uh, in the first time, uh, the progress is very, very important. Uh, why? The, the, the property 
thing is, is to show is the correct and accurate way achieving a maximum efficiency without missing uh, the target. This is, this is very important to to paint uh, with a CT scan, uh, MRI in different uh, types of, of, of studies of MRI, like astrography and other type of of the of the of these types of studies. The appropriate uh, property planning, precise and particular anatomy to the target important than the uh, other types of procedures in this type of procedures uh, uh, target and it's uh, the particular anatomy of this part of the case and the, the particular details of the anatomical windows of the Plagnoidal space to uh, the anatomical uh, uh, specialties of the of this any type of patient. Second, the positioning is essential for creating a keyhole craniotomy. Is to achieve optimal to the target in the region without positioning related dangers. It's very, very important to the position uh, because uh, uh, the, the, the position guide to the neurosurgeon uh, uh, optimal surgical access. This type of the, of the posterior force approach uh, in this case of the meningiomas, the front position comfort for the patient visualization other uh, the anatomical landmarks uh, the landmarks of the of the posterior force approach is is so important for uh, recognize the transverse sinus the to the sigmoid sinus and to other other types of the anatomical particularities in the in the, in the patient and in the target. The target uh, I, I, I saw is very important. Surgical dissection, the surgical dissection uh, to to see you uh, in this to the skin as soft tissues. And the, opening the session the session after the craniotomy is very important uh, firstly begin with the drainage of the cerebrospinal fluid after that the section of the arachnoidal membranes if we had uh, these two steps uh, we, we we could begin the, the first evaluation with the uh, scalp it's called we are great we can make a procedure, any type of procedure, in this case, uh, to the meningioma uh, with a, with a, if, if we, if we, if we, if we can, uh, in, internal debulking. Uh, as the, as the, in the final step, in the keyhole concept is a closedura with a one tank continuous suture. It's very important to the to the, to this step uh, to avoid any complication. The first uh, the first type of the the lateral occipital retromastoid uh, show the different uh, variation and different whites to the into the uh, of the approach in super variation the anatomy of the of the uh, we show first the transversal sinus the sigmoid sinus uh, in lateral position, the superior petrous sinus. Sometimes we can went deep into the into the uh, 
lateral part of the lateral part of the of the posterior fossa, the angle between the posterior surface of the petrous bone and the tentoria, the tentoria and the incisor dorsal and lateral tentoria surface of the cerebellum, posterior lateral surface of the mesencephalum, and the uh, three, four, five, six, seven, and se uh, six, seven and eight ner uh, coronal nerves. Uh, in the vessels, it's important to know the vascular apex, uh, including perforators. Superior cerebral artery variation and the superior and caudal variation is 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 a, is a mix of the of of, of what uh, of the superior and caudal variation. Uh, uh, the most usually view uh, when when we uh, uh, like. Uh, a photo cerebellar angle meningiomas. The phrase uh, anatomy of the central variation is the transversal sinus, the posterior surface of the petrous bone, part of the, of the scope uh, with cerebral uh, The petrosal surface of the cerebellum, the floculus, uh, is a very important lemma to 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 the uh, scope. Surface of the pons and the cranial nerves, uh, middle and lower cranial nerves. To recognize the voice dialect, correct pressures of the four ventricle. This this slide shows uh, uh, some of the anatomy of the uh, uh, neural structures of the posterior fossa. Uh, show the vessels and cranial nerves in the pontocerebral angles. It's important, uh, as we say, as I say, the flocculus to recognize the pontocerebral angle. And we will show the seven and eight uh, cranial nerve. Uh, to being at, at this time of the procedure, it's necessary to training with a, a, a computer, a 3D computer, recognize the vascular structure of the posterior fossa. Uh, this photograph uh, shows of the posterior fossa approach, in this case, the, the keyhole endoscopic approach of the posterior fossa. Uh, the position may be with the uh, posterior fossa meningiomas. Uh, firstly, uh, the elevation of the other head with uh, 15 grades at the level of the thorax. After that, rotate the 70 to 55 uh, grades uh, to the contralateral side. 10 grades uh, to, to make uh, the tentorio. Uh, to the to the, to the surgeon. Uh, after that, uh, last uh, the lateral flexion uh, is that in the pen of the of the target. If the target is, is uh, more deep, the lateral flexion is 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 more is more than than lateral flexion in in other lesions. As, as I said, uh, the line marks is very important. Uh, uh, this photograph shows uh, four line marks, particularly externals, the asterion, and the uh, and the, uh, the the last part of the of the, the lateral part of the of the of the future craniotomy. Uh, to the opening uh, straight or uh, slightly cure skin incision in the retroauricular area uh, to uh, 2.5 to, uh, to width and, and age. Uh, the, the dissection of the superficial and deep uh, muscles and facia uh, Asterium, than the transition of the transverse sinus. 
Uh, the asterisk is, as we know, uh, is a transition of the of the, of the straight between transverse sinus into the sigmoid sinus. This photograph shows uh, the different steps to the to the mastoidomus, the superficial fascia, and the proper neck muscles. We, we can <coughs> a craniectomy with a yes when we make a, a the craniectomy, a craniectomy uh, after after procedure is, uh, is to begin a, a durotomy the durotomy uh, can make or we can make a curvilinear uh, durotomy as we show, or in the in the cruciform, this is the the first view uh, to to the lateral aspect of the posterior force approach. There, <coughs> in this part of photograph, we show the the petrous bone. Through the petrous bone in in, in aura, uh, rise of the of the of the spring part the tenturing anatomy of the force as we show the the third nerve uh, the origin of the third nerve. The, the posterior uh, cerebr cerebral artery. The uh, also in the retro sigmoid approach. We can, as we can see, the floclus. The parasite, the seven and eight uh, cranial nerves. Entering into the internal acoustic meatus. It's very important to, uh, as we, when we navigate to the scope of the endoscope, uh, please re recognize the anatomical structures uh, as neurovascular structures. Very, very important to uh, to begin in any any approach. Uh -huh. Okay. The effect of the of the lateral part of the uh, ten nerve, the eleven nerve, nine, and the respect. Okay. Took of tip of approach in the main. Uh, the, the only difference with the classical suboccipital approach is the size of the craniotomy. The size of the craniotomy is uh, two, four, uh, two centimeters. Uh, the, the anatomical uh, aspect in the in this in this part of approach is the posterior circumference of the foramen minor, the marginal sinus and occipital sinus is very important to maintain uh, this sinus in the duotomy digital surface of the cerebral hemispheres, lower vermis and vehicula, bellum. The choroid plexus of the four ventricle. Plexus of the four ventricle is the first uh, anatomical landmark uh, to recognize in the telovelar approach. The cervical medullar in, in, in Johnson uh, surface of the medulla oblongata. Denticulate ligaments is very the articulated ligaments with uh, the spinal nerves 
uh, in some case of the uh, more fundamental approach, but in, in this type of, of approach, it is, it is most important to, to recognize the, the lenticular ligaments in case of the uh, this this type to liberate the the the, the, the middle. And the the current 12, 11, 10, and 9. And some of the vessels, more important, the vertebrae, the pica, the perforators, most important to preserve the perforators, uh, avoid any any trouble with the, the approach. Ventricle, to recognize the growth place goal, the rhomboid force, foramen of lust, the fastigium, and aqueduct a posterior uh, part of the approach to make a, a keyhole suboccipital approach is important to elevate uh, in the anti trend uh, head like uh, 15 grades after that uh, of the of the head Avoiding uh, the, the troll with the airway and the uh, 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 venous drainage. Uh, I rotate the head uh, 5 to 15 grades, uh, dependent of the target. Uh, uh, again, it's important to uh, recognize the target, the target and the tip of the superficial position of the target to to make any uh, change of the, of the position. It's not so different to the to the classical uh, occipital suboccipital approach. Uh, the the skin incision being in the in and finalized in the C2, some case in the uh, with uh, uh, a middle uh, 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 dissection, uh, it may be with uh, some non dissection, uh, other surgeons uh, like with uh, uh, monopolar dissection, with monopolar dissection, to uh, finally expose the. C1 uh, or, or the atlas uh, and to the cervical uh, medial junction of the, of the posterior part of the junction of the uh, cervical uh, cervical cranial junction. We can make uh, two mini boreholes to create the, the, the cranial craniotomy. To that with a, 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 a if we if we if we can uh, we can make uh, the the craniotomy with a or or the uh, craniotomy to make the the craniotomy uh, the exposure of the dura. We can uh, make the rotomy with uh, uh, like a a a, a, a uh, uh, Mr. Jeffrey, uh, just we have uh, uh, only three minutes. Uh, the decision. We are. You have to go to the end, please. Uh, yes, finally, uh, after the decision is, is the important part of the of the suboccipital approach in the keyhole endoscopic approach of the of the part of, of tumors in case of any geomas is uh, recognize the posterior part of the neurovascular structure of the posterior fossa. Uh, the cistern magna is the first uh, uh, lama to recognize 
uh, we can, uh, as the uh, first principle of the keyhole approach, is the uh, uh, relax with the liberate the spinal fluid and navigate the of the uh, uh, sustainal uh, uh, navigation. In this case, the uh, system nine. Uh, after that, we can recognize the vertebral arteries in the the perforators, the the pica. Uh, finally, the, the the structure of the cerebellum. In this case, of the of the permis and uh, inferior part of the the hemispheres of the cerebellum. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Jeffrey, for this uh, great uh, speech and great presentation. And thank you, Mr. John Pennett, for your uh, very kind, helpful support. Uh, I think we are going to the to finish the first uh, session, and we're going then for the uh, uh, official formal ceremony in the the presence of the Yemeni Prime Minister, just in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, unfortunately, okay. it will be in, in Arabic language, so you can, uh, if you want, Mr. John Perry, to follow us, uh, just to uh, to see the live uh, ceremony, and then we can start the, the second session uh, in, in one hour with a local speaker. Then you are going to arrange for the second international one on the uh, through the the, uh -huh, okay. the, the neurological TV, okay? And okay, okay. Last, I know and the, and the second session is, is, is local too. Okay. Okay, Mr. John? Okay, very good. Yeah, uh, I, I'm going to stop the broadcast and please, uh, I, need, I need to talk to you, okay? Yeah, okay, Mr. John. Okay. I'm okay, here. Okay, thank you. Until after break in one hour, correct? Yes, okay. Uh, it was great to have you in the first session. Uh, it was very fantastic start. Thank you so much for you and for your speaker, for your guest from. Uh, India and from Ecuador. Uh, I think we are going to have a very fantastic, interesting session in the next. And now we are going to finish the first session with uh, a great uh, regard for you and your guys. And we're, we are going now to start to uh, the official uh, opening ceremony with the pre presence of the His Excellency Prime Minister and he's, he's coming on. Okay, very good.